Greetings, Art History 2. I hope all of you are doing very well. As you can see me behind me, we're at the signing of the Constitution. So we've actually gone back in time to Independence Hall in Philadelphia. Today, we will actually be covering the Enlightenment period and neoclassicism. Um, not Enlightenment is what we call the philosophy of the time period from 1750 to 1825. Neoclassicism is what we call the art. And ironically, we call the art classical music. Those mainstays of Wolfgang Amadeus Mozart and of Beethoven. And so you can see the images that show up here. Now, there are a number of different features that are going to um, drive us towards the Enlightenment, towards the neoclassical. And it's going to be these four. So it's a combination of four different historical events that bring here that we will actually talk through. So one is going to be the agricultural revolution that takes place in the 18th century. And that's going to really bring a urban migration. So people are going to move from the very rural farming communities into the very urban working poor neighborhoods with the industrial revolution as well. We're gonna go through the scientific revolution and we're nearly at the end of it, but all the transformations and changes that we way we do things are gonna transform the way we think about the world. And that goes from 1500 to 1800. We're going to have classical music from 1750 to 1825 and the philosophy behind the enlightenment and the belief in individual rights, God-given rights, also from the exact same time period. Now, the scientific revolution started very much earlier than this. We go all the way back to about 1500, and we can look at everyone from Johannes Kepler, Galileo Galilei, all the way back even to the Renaissance with the development of anatomy and engineering from Leonardo da Vinci. And these kind of inventions are gonna challenge the way the church had presented the world that we live in. So if you think about the inventions of the scientific revolution over here on the left, think about this. We have the idea of the microscope, where we can now look at tiny little fractions and find out there are even microscopic things that we cannot see that are living not only around us, but actually on our skin itself. We're going to invent a thermometer where we can actually start to categorize temperatures rather than hot or cold. We're going to actually have the mathematical tools to be able to do that. We're going to create a refractor telescope which basically proves once and for all that we do not live in an earth-centered world the geocentric world we absolutely live in the heliocentric world and those heavenly bodies are not perfect and their orbits are not particularly circles they're not perfect orbits they're elliptical in every shape a calculator which basically becomes the forerunner that's going to lead us into computer technology and thinking in kind of larger numbers than we've ever been able to think before. And the idea of even traveling underwater by submarine. All of these are gonna be part of the context that starts to develop during this time period. And you can see here, we very much move from that, as I mentioned, the heliocentric universe. Um, we actually move into that where you can actually see this basically solves all the issues that we have from the geocentric universe. Because if you have Earth as the center, here's how the orbit of the sun and the planets would have to be. And if you really do see it, it looks ridiculous. It also explains then that we have satellites and other planets might have satellite moons that are orbiting around them as well for that to work. Uh, we are gonna start classifying animals. We are going to have Sir Isaac Newton split color into light to try to explain how stained glass gives us this beautiful origin. That white light is really a combination of all the other lights that show up. Now, if we look at the tools that are developed, think about how radically this is going to alter the way that we see the world. We're gonna have Galileo Galilei inventing a telescope that is 30 times more powerful than what we've seen before, showing us imperfect worlds. We just talked about the invention of those tiny little creatures with the compound microscope. Da Vinci is going to come up and to basically announce and then describe human anatomy. We're gonna have Sir Francis Bacon describe the empirical method and come up with scientific studies. Descartes is going to introduce analytical geometry. Pascal is going to invent the mercury barometer so we can actually see pressure gradient and how that changes with temperature. We're going to invent a pendulum clock so we actually know what time it is besides just a sundial. We're going to discover with Leeuwenhoek, the microscopic protozoa, these tiny little building blocks of light. Newton is going to use the prism to analyze light. Leibniz develops the machine that multiplies and divides, becomes our calculator, basically the basis for our computer in the future. Newton is going to find the laws of grad gravitation that work the three laws of gravitation. Pope is actually going to come up with the essay of man, which explains mankind's place in the universe from a scientific rather than a Christian religious perspective. Lavoisier is going to invent chemistry in 1732. 
we're going to have Linnaeus, one of the first botanists, that's going to come up with plant classification system that's based and kind of improved upon what Aristotle had done in the Greek world. We're going to have Diderot publish the first encyclopedia out of a coffee shop, categorizing all sorts of human knowledge from A to Z. We're going to have Johnson creating the first English dictionary. So now we have a resource to go when we don't understand a word, not knowing whether it's made up or whether it's a new piece of speech or figure of speech. And finally, we're going to have Adam Smith, 1776, the year of our founding, publishing The Wealth of Nations with labor and not land as the foundation of wealth, leading us into the capitalist stretch, which has allowed America, at least in the last 50, 60 years, to really become one of the world's superpowers. We are basically then moving and inventing during the neoclassical enlightenment age, we are creating the modern world. We are basically adding science and science is actually now known to question religion. The true base of knowledge then is to try to combine those two together to try to make sure that we have science and knowledge or science and religion together in terms of whether it's evolution versus creationism to see here. This is a funny cartoon that was actually published during this time period or just after it showing Darwin and his theory of evolution, how he must have evolved from an ape. So Adam in your past, absolutes from God, God sets the rules, or is it ape? Relative morality where man sets the rules. So we are going to go through this process that shows up. And so in the scientific revolution, we see ridiculous things. And it totally does sound like he is saying Galileo, if you know that song at all. Luckily, I don't have to listen to that song too many more times. Not my favorite song. And we're just waiting for it to kind of give us control again. There we go. So as we go through this and think through all the process and the new ways, we are going to come up with new scientific ways of looking at the world. And one of them that we now know is that you can eat to make your brain more powerful. Each food basically provides a certain type of your body with certain types of food, whether that be for neurotransmitters. And so here, if you actually eat healthy fish and nuts, those are fats and lipids you get from omega-3 and 6. And that's why probably the Japanese population lives so long, we do believe, because of the healthy fish that they are eating that helps with brain functioning into elder age. We have amino acid proteins, building blocks of neurotransmitter, which regulate mood, sleep, weight, and, and attention. And so if you eat healthy amino acids, healthy proteins, lean chicken, lean fish, you can actually help not just your own weight and attention, but your mood and your sleep over time. Carbohydrates from complex starches, sugar and fiber power for your executive functioning of your frontal lobes right here, which actually help in the process of retaining information and then rethinking about different aspects of, of information. Candy bar won't work because that's a simple sugar, but more complex carbohydrate like whole grain um, foods that will show up. And then micronutrients from fruits and vegetables control free radicals. These are the thing that, uh, that actually cause some problems within your body when you have these free radicals. And so by controlling those with fruits and vegetables, you actually are able to formulate memories and study longer. Actually, there's a real boost up as you start getting used to it. The best thing that you can actually do as a student, ironically, I mean, besides read and do what you're supposed to do, is work out and eat healthy. If you have work out, eat healthy, and at the same time, do these other things, um, the study, the study over time, you be a remarkably powerful student and will actually carry over not just in the student life, but also into your work life too in that first job. I highly recommend getting into balanced diet if you can. And it's really hard because you're like, I'm under such a time crunch now. But if you can get this under control at least a little bit now, even with a healthy lunch rather than you know, picking up fast food, the effects can be enormous long term. All right. And for us, the agricultural revolution is going to be the other thing that shows up. We are going to have new farming equipment that's developed. And because of that, we no longer need as many rural uneducated labor. Now there's no free public schools, so that really is uneducated, um, uh, uneducated labor. They're going to migrate to the cities. And luckily with the industrial revolution, we're going to start absorbing some of them into the new factory work, which is really going to make the world go. So this industrialized nation that's showing up. Now they're gonna live in very dark, dank places like you can see here from our lovely magician coming out of um, the crimes of Grunewald, the Harry Potter series, I guess, prequels that are showing up. But you can see how dirty and dank and dark London was. It really was a cesspool. Later on, we're going to have a major call outbreak that's going to kill hundreds of thousands of individuals. 
And finally, in about 1850, we're going to figure out, oh, clean running water. But no, we're not even there to this period yet with neoclassical. And we're going to have 30% of urban poverty. So the, the idea of the scientific revolution, that agricultural revolution, which is going to call migration, or in the middle of the industrial revolution, and the enlightenment thinkers all coming together with the new philosophy about the way that we think and we believe in logic, is going to have a profound impact moving us towards the modern world. So as we look at this, you can see science and reading, reason together are going to be considered the, the source for the modern condition. We're going to still celebrate the artistic triumphs of classical Greece and Rome. Hence, it's called neoclassicism in terms of the art. Note, we cannot call it classical because we already had a classical period. That was Greece and Rome. We can't call it Renaissance, the rebirth. We've already had that. So our choices are neoclassical or neo-Renaissance. And scholars have gone with neoclassical for this time period that's rebirthing it. They're going to invent the concept of personal happiness, which people had talked about before, but never really analyzed. And how do we achieve happiness from a philosophical standpoint? And they're going to search for uniform natural laws, which basically are the equivalent of uniform human moral laws. And so if we were to go to a coffee shop during this time period, or to a tea shop if we were in England, you would see wonderful individuals, very bright individuals, having their own tables, and that was their workspace. They used those as mail rooms, as well as they often use them for their office space. So I'll show you one of these, these coffee houses, tea houses in a moment, but you have Benjamin Franklin at one of them. You have um, Goethe, you have Hume, you have Kant, who's talking about the categorical imperative, basically universals should do moral actions. So you do, do universal if you wish that everyone else would do that same action. Um, we have Diderot writing the first encyclopedia at one of these coffee shops and is thinking in France about inalienable rights at a coffee shop. You have Burke talking about the beginning of the conservative political movement. You have Voltaire writing Candide talking about um, how you, how, how unjust a society is and how we need to correct from the injustice basically through good actions. That's showing up. These are all being done in a coffee house. And probably the best synopsis of this time period then comes out of our lovely Declaration of Independence, which shows up on my shirt along with the Constitution here. We tr hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, and they do mean men, and they do mean white men, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness that to secure these rights, governments are instituted among men deriving their just powers from the consent of the government. Thomas Jefferson is one of the framers of the Constitution, the major writer from 1776. And this is the best synopsis of why enlightenment thought. We do have a creator God. We are endowed with universal rights. We are starting to think about equality, at least for white heterosexual Christian men. We are looking for um, the opportunity for a pursuit of happiness, for liberty amongst all. And one of them, and those are unalienable rights, meaning they come from God, not from an individual. And then we are constituting the government. So if it stops working for a majority of the people, for democracy, re re reverting back to ancient Greece, we can give that up again. Like we can form a different government. And so artworks that change the world. This is based upon kind of the, the categorical imperative that's showing up out of Kant. This is one of them that's being kind of written up in a, co in a coffee house. And here's Kant's understanding of that. We should act as if our action should become the law for all humankind. In other words, we should act in ways justified by reason, so universal that they are good for all persons at all times. It's not enough that our actions, uh, that our actions have good effects. It is necessary that the will be good. So the idea is that we want to make a universal law based upon the idea that both the action and the consequences, they are both intended to do good. So for example, let's eliminate slavery, right? We all today can actually look back and say, that is the best thing. Free men participating in free activities is much better than anything else. Professor Fraser, I hope that you are better teaching art than you are at playing basketball. Thank you, former President Obama. So there was uh, my friend, President Obama.
actually informing us that he, well, first off, after smack talking me on the basketball court, let me tell you, he ain't that good either. He's tall, but he's getting older and lost a step. He's got a pretty good shot from the outside. But he's introducing us to one of the artworks that changed the world, the we, the people here, one of the most influential writings in human history that really establishes unalienable human rights from God for all people that the government should never be able to take away. And if they do, you have the right to revolt or revolution. So if this is one of the 10 most important ideas and concepts that comes down in writing from human history, what do you think the other nine are? Where would this rank in that top 10 list? All right, good. One of them is going to be the Bible. In fact, that's going to come in number one. More influence on any other written source so far. All right, the Quran. Good. And here are our other ones. So when we look at the top 10, here's generally what we get. This is from the Library of Congress. And again, associated with the United Nations Sustainable Development Goal, the 10 most influential writings in world history for impact that they have on society throughout history and today. Number one is the Bible, followed by the Quran followed by the governing body in um, China throughout most of its history, Confucius' Analects, the Bhagavad Gita, which sends the, the aspect of um, Hindu religious worship, the Iliad, founding the Western Empire tradition. Number six is the Torah. Number seven, the United States Constitution, the Republic by Plato, the wealth of nations, the, the idea of capitalism, and the Communist Manifesto, the other basic economic policy that we've been trying to go back and forth between for the last 150 years by Karl Marx. Now, as we set up a capitalist system that allows for free men to make free choices, we needed an idea. And so we took the ancient Greek model, right? The ancient Greek model is wealthy or at least land owning individuals would actually, and that are male, would have a vote. And so kind of the father of the family. We extended that out. And so you didn't necessarily have to be land owning, but white men had the right to vote. And we are going to base ours not just on the Greek model, which was very far back in history, but upon the Haudenosaunee, more commonly you would know them as the Iroquois. They preferred not to be called that because that's an enemy, that's a name their enemy gave them, which means uh, people of the, the black snakes. Haudenosaunee means people of the longhouse, the longhouse where they lived. And it was five Native American tribes that joined together to have a democratic vote and if three of them voted to go to war, all five were then recorded, re recorded to go to war. Kind of the way our states are set up for our national government. In fact, this is where the ideas come from. And the individual that helps establish that is a Haudenosaunee man named the Great Peacemaker, one of the first great Americans long before we are here. So this is a Native American individual. And the comment is, in all acts, out, out, act out of interest for the Confederation, and not your own self-interest. Have the future always in your thoughts and the past. Think about where we've been, learn the lessons from the past, also where we want to go in the future, but think about the whole group. What's best for the whole group, not just for your individual. And that's one of the challenges of democracy. Democracy might be the best form of government if you can have people that are willing to vote against their own interest because it's better for other individuals. And that is a huge challenge within democracy. So here's an explanation then of the Haudenosaunee Conference or Confederacy that was actually invited by Benjamin Franklin and Thomas Jefferson to be present on the second floor of Independence Hall when we were working out the Constitution. I think because um, you know, originally um, the truth is that the Constitution does come from the Iroquois Confederacy. It does come, and the U.S. Congress acknowledged that not long ago, that it does indeed influence by the, the you find out uh, Franklin and Jefferson did go and spend at least 30 years before and learn the, the Mohawk jargon, the Mohegan jargon, all the Iroquois jargon and trade and learn and sat with their councils and, and studied and like, wow, these people had equality, men and women. And they said, how can we? And, and we still didn't get that into our constitution until hundreds of years later. That lived the same way, the same principles. So it was not just the Iroquois, but you know, the Constitution was in this part in Philadelphia and in the Northeast. So, so that's where they talk about. It. In fact, Jake Swamp and Tom Porter, who are traditional chiefs to this day of the uh, Iroquois Confederacy, um, have those stories that are not written in history books. They may be referenced, 
but where the Iroquois chiefs were asked to come to the Freedom Hall in Independence Hall in Philadelphia, they were put upstairs. And whenever the, the, the Continental Congress had deliberations, they would go upstairs and ask the Native people, what did you do when you got to this part? And the thing that we don't hear is that these chiefs were locked into the upstairs. They only brought food and, and questions. And we don't hear the other part of, you know, how the, the founding fathers actually excluded the Native people. Well, that's the mindset, because this country needed an enemy. And the women and children, well, they were property of the rich white males, and they couldn't vote. And the black man was property also, so they couldn't vote. Women belonged, uh, poor white people belonged that serfs or serfdom and that, and that thinking of it. And they were property, they couldn't vote, they didn't have power. But then you had millions upon millions of Native people. Let's not let them vote. Let's not let them vote, because that means they're going to be power here. So from that time, we were mentioned as far as governing being governed by commerce, and that the United States did have say in what they traded with other countries or whatnot. And, that's and, what and, and so unfortunately, that is one of the original sins of the United States of America. So we took one of the best ideas that had ever been invented. And if you probably don't know this, but the Haudenosaunee still today is the longest functioning democracy in world history. It lasted for the better part of 700 years. We are the second longest functioning democracy in world history, and we are about 250 years now. So we have hundreds of years to go before we even get to the extent of what the Haudenosaunee. And then the original sin, of course, in the United States is we did not even allow them to have the right to vote or any rights, even though they were living on the same territory and were within the American process and were born in the American territories that white men, white women had those particular rights of citizenship, even if we didn't give the rights of, of women to vote. And so another very famous way of explaining this, actually, and probably many of you know this, is Schoolhouse Rock. This was a cartoon out in the late 1970s, early 1980s. We used to have Saturday morning cartoons because we didn't have 24-hour Nickelodeon or other things, so I grew up watching Schoolhouse Rock. Most important documents then in world history. And then it goes through the refrain a second time. So as we're talking about this and setting up the modern world, let's talk about two of the amendments that make the Constitution one of the greatest documents in world history. So the Amendment One. Note Amendment One is the first amendment, and before they even passed the Constitution, they had assurances that they would be passing that first amendment. And note, so they put a bunch of um, of rights that don't necessarily belong in just one amendment, but they wanted to make sure that they could actually get people to pass it so it became part of the foundational elements of our Constitution. So this is the first amendment of the Constitution and the Bill of Rights. Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof or abridging the freedom of speech or of the press or of the people to write and assemble and to petition the government for redress of grievances. Now, as we look at those five different basic freedoms that show up, two of them are pretty remarkable even today that the government almost cannot limit to peaceably assemble and to petition the, the government for a redress of grievances. In the vast majority of the world, if the government wants something, 
they actually can almost just take it without even paying you. And that's true even in countries such as um, England, it's part of the United Kingdom. So this makes us very special. Government wants something that is personally owned by you. You have to get fair value for it, even if they need it for eminent domain to make a highway or um, to make a military base, you still get paid for that thing. This is establishing us really as a very unique kind of foundation. The one that I want to actually spend more time on is this one here, the establishment of religion, which poses all sorts of problems in the modern day world. How do, first off, how do we even define a religion? Because the constitution doesn't define it. You know, is Haitian Vodun a religion? Is, um, you know, and Mormonism is a religion? How do we uh, determine what is a religion versus what is a, a set of spiritual beliefs becomes one of the issue. And the major court case that's coming up um, throughout the United States so Supreme Court system right now is what are we going to do with under God and the Pledge of Allegiance? If you don't know the Pledge of Allegiance, the Pledge of Allegiance to the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, that phrase was actually added in the 1950s. It wasn't originally part of our Pledge of Allegiance. It was added later on because we were in the Korean War fighting a Buddhist nation, and we very much wanted to establish ourselves as being different than that Buddhist nation, which they also claimed was one nation under God or under the Buddhist um, establishment of hierarchy. And so this was brought to the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court ruled it as unconstitutional. And so it cannot be forced in public settings to make someone say under God within that Pledge of Allegiance because it was clearly the establishment of a Christian religion. That's why it was put in the 1950s. So what do we do with our lovely money, our quarters, our pennies that say in God we trust? Now that goes back longer. That's been on our money since the very beginning of time. But isn't that also an establishment of religion? Because Jews do not call their God God. Muslims do not call their God God. Greeks and Romans never called their God, God. They had their own name, Zeus, Jupiter. And so isn't that also a Christian religion? And here's the thing, it might be. You have the ability, note with the, in the amendment number one at the very end, you have the right to petition the government for redress of grievances. So if this offends you, you have the right to see your government. And we currently have this lawsuit going in. It's already made it to the Texas Supreme Court. They, as far as I know, have not ruled yet but they are potentially going to rule on it. And then it could actually get pushed up to the high court, the United States Supreme Court. And if it is ruled unconstitutional, we will have to take that off of our money because it would be then uh, established as a, an actual religion. Amendment number two is the other one we wanna look at. And this is a challenging one because we actually have to look at the amendment from an amendment perspective and what the words say. So here's amendment number two sometimes just referred to as the right to bear arms. A well-regulated militia being necessary to the security of a free state, the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. Now, one of the problems that we have here, so you look at where the commas are located here, a well-regulated militia being necessary to the security of a free state. All right, so there's one phrase. The right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. No, the commas are in very weird places here, going back into the 17th and 18th century, in terms of a very different writing style that shows up. And here's part of the, the, the condition. The Supreme Court has already ruled that we can make legitimate concerns and restraints on people owning guns. And so those, and the question always is, what's a legitimate concern? If we go back and we look just from the historical evidence, before we talk about the wording and what comes up, a typical revolutionary era musket had a one round capacity, you could shoot one bullet. It effectively, if you were really good, you could shoot three times a minute. The muzzle velocity is about a thousand feet per second, but the average accuracy is 150 feet. That's it. So if you are accurate, you can't do a mass shooting because by the time you fire the first one, either someone can take you out because most people owned a, um, a musket back then, or alternatively, you would have time to run away from the individual who can't run and load the weapon at the same time. If we look at a typical modern day AR-15 uh, beneath it, we have a magazine capacity of about 30 rounds. The effective rate of fire is 45, but can even kind of pretty, pretty quickly moderated to go 60 rounds per minute. The muzzle velocity note is three times, but look at the range is the enormous feature. 
the range and the capacity. And so that means you literally could shoot multiple individuals, you know, up to 30 or 40 individuals a minute. And if no one else is armed, you could actually do some real damage killing, you know, as we've seen in Las Vegas, 50 people in a matter of minutes or in Columbine, 17 people in three minutes or in four minutes. Now, as we take that argument, we've got to relate it and really look at the words. A well-regulated militia, all right, so militia can own guns, but who's a militia? Is the militia only owned by the state? Is that only the National Guard? Or alternatively, are you able to form your own militia? It's never defined, so that becomes one error, one problem we have. The other thing, it says, the right of the people. Now, here's where it gets tricky. I don't want everyone to have guns, my own personal opinion. However, I firmly believe in the Constitution and the American way of life. I, I think there's been almost nothing better in world history in terms of promoting people out of poverty with capitalism. And, people. and so what, we, what I like to say is that we have the, the best, worst system that's been currently developed. There may be something out there that's better, that's more fair. So far, no other human civilization out of 40,000 has made anything better. So we've moved more people out of poverty, we have more fair rights than almost anywhere else on the, on the planet, and we're getting better every year, or almost getting better every year moving forward. But the idea of the right of the people, the right of the people appears in four out of the first 10 amendments. And only in this case have we determined the right of the people not to mean everyone. In the other three, the right of the people to assemble, that means everyone can assemble. The right of the people to have free press. All people have that right. Free speech, it's for everyone. Religion, for everyone. Only here have we determined that the right of the people is only for some people. Now, the Supreme Court has already said, yes, we can make stipulations. We don't want people that are mentally incapacitated to own a weapon, right? We don't want people that are blind to own a weapon because of the inherent danger for them and themselves. But shouldn't almost everyone else be able to own a weapon? And this becomes a real issue in the modern day world. You know, working in a public institution, shouldn't a 18 year old adult student be able to register a firearm and bring that firearm to class? Whether I like it or not, doesn't matter. I have to believe in the American system, that's the constitution that has led us to where we currently are. And we can, and the rest of the world can call us gun happy, trigger happy, however they want. We've been more successful economically and kind of raising people out of poverty and with equal rights almost than anywhere else in the world. Our system has proven to be very effective over the last 250 years. If I really look at the constitution, I say, yeah, we probably should allow that. Knowing full well that an AR-15, maybe that's too much firepower, but no, we probably have to come up with some ruling in between the two because it does say the right of the people to keep and bear arms. It is actually embedded within the Constitution. So the NRA very much does have a point here. Now, earlier on, what I had mentioned is this. The great coffee shop and tea, cup, tea shops of the world. This one might be the greatest. This is Café Procopé. It's in Paris in the 6th Arrière du Mont. This is a greatest restaurant for history piece. And that is because here I've laid it out. Thomas Jefferson, when he was the French ambassador um, from America to France, this was his table. Now, not the exact table, but that was his speak, seat. This is where Voltaire writes Candide right next to him. And Voltaire wrote Candide on 40 cups of coffee and chocolate together. He's basically inventing mocha. Diderot writes the encyclopedia, the next one over. And Benjamin Franklin's table is right around the corner. Napoleon trades his hat for food here. So that Phrygian liberty cap of France was, uh, the French Revolution was first shown here. And so the ideas. And the best and brightest men are working in these coffee shops, basically ancient Starbucks or 200 year old Starbucks. This is where these ideas, and so they would take breaks and talk with one another and share ideas and news from around the world that they knew. And that really is why Diderot was able to compose a pretty comprehensive encyclopedia at these coffee shops. So here's the history of coffee and tea to show you how they so impacted the world that we live in. Coffee has a deep history, which can be traced back to Ethiopia. The way we consume coffee has evolved dramatically. It is likely that people initially chewed the berries and leaves of the coffee plant until they discovered that you could brew them to make tea. Coffee consumption continued to evolve until someone started roasting coffee beans and ground them to produce a form of coffee we are familiar with today. 
By the 16th century, coffee spread to Egypt, Syria, Turkey, and Persia. In the 17th century, coffee had made its way to Europe. There, it became popular, and soon coffee houses were established. These coffee houses became centers of social activity, and they were commonplace in major cities in Austria, England, Germany, Holland, and Italy. By this point, coffee began to replace the common breakfast drink of the time, wine and beer. People who drank coffee instead of alcohol began their day with energy and the quality of their work improved. Coffee consumption in Europe started increasing during the age of the Enlightenment. In fact, some of the brightest people throughout history were fans of coffee because of its stimulating effect on the body. In the mid-17th century, coffee was brought to New Amsterdam, later called New York by the British. Originally, tea was the favored drink in America until 1773, when the colonists revolted against the tax on tea imposed by King George III. The revolt was known as the Boston Tea Party, and it ultimately changed Americans' drinking preferences to coffee. In the latter half of the 17th century, the Dutch got coffee seedlings and successfully planted it on the island of Java, Indonesia. Eventually, coffee spread to the islands of Sumatra and Celebes. In 1714, the mayor of Amsterdam presented a coffee plant to King Louis XIV of France, which was soon planted in the Royal Botanical Garden in Paris. A few years later, a naval officer by the name of That's Gabriel the de Clou Louis XIV obtained a seedling from the Versailles. King's Garden to take to Central the America. Thing. After a challenging voyage, the plant was successfully transported to Martinique. Once planted, that seedling grew and became the ancestor to 18 million coffee trees on the island. That seedling eventually became the parent of all coffee trees in the Caribbean, as well as South and Central America. Today, coffee is consumed in all parts of the world, and it's become one of the most popular beverages in the world. Part of the reason why coffee is so popular is because it makes us feel energized. The reason coffee makes us feel so alert is because it contains caffeine, which is a stimulant. Caffeine makes us more alert by altering normal biological mechanisms responsible for making us fall asleep. Cells in our body break down a molecule called adenosine triphosphate for energy. One of the breakdown products for this process is adenosine. As the brain uses up energy throughout the day, adenosine levels increase inside our brain. When adenosine levels build up, they bind to adenosine receptors in the brain which are responsible for sleep. This results in a cascade of biochemical reactions which cause us to fall asleep. During sleep, the brain replenishes energy reserves and begins to eliminate adenosine. Eventually, adenosine levels decreases and you wake up feeling refreshed. The caffeine molecule is structurally very similar to adenosine, but they aren't exactly the same, so caffeine can't activate adenosine receptors. When caffeine competes to bind to an adenosine receptor, it prevents normal brain signaling from happening, which enables us to sleep. This results in extended periods of wakefulness. Caffeine's effect on our brain doesn't last forever. It has a half-life of about six hours. Eventually, caffeine in your body is metabolized and can no longer block adenosine from binding to its receptors, so you eventually get tired and fall asleep. And the caffeine crash later on. And, some no. coffee has a and so that's where it comes from. And so with all these different ideas as we're looking at the art, what's happening is that during the neoclassical enlightenment period, we are codifying human behaviors as rational. We're looking for happiness, effectiveness, and rights. We are going to slowly grow birth of nation states. And so we're going to need propaganda putting our nation states together. What does it mean to be American? What does it mean to be a citizen of the French nation? What does it mean to be English? And so this is going to cause nations to develop national histories to unify citizens together. This is where our art is going to come in. So this entire backstory leads us to George Washington as the father of our country. And so the things we have to look at are strange, though. So the founding myths of America, they're myths. We made them up. George Washington, that cherry tree he chopped down, said, I will never tell a lie. Myth, never happened. Washington crossing the Delaware in this, never happened. It was night. He's going the wrong way. The flag wasn't made yet. Betsy Ross making that flag, didn't happen. Most likely, it's probably Martha Washington who made our first flag. Paul Revere's ride, he made it to the first town, then they would finish. So Paul Revere's ride was by Longfellow later on, um, and it published in a poem. Not really happened. Actually, it should have been called a different person's ride. Someone else made that ride. Thir turkey for um, Turkey Day for Thanksgiving, 
probably not a, a real, and if it was, it was a small amount. And Independence Day on July 4th, you know, 1776, not true. First day we actually read it out to the public, but the public knew we'd already signed off on July 1st. Really should be our Independence Day. So again, we have made up our national history to bind us together, even when we didn't necessarily need to. They're going to do the exact same thing. Now we just came out of that frivolity of the um, Rococo period. So we still have that on the mind. Before comparing Baroque art versus neoclassicism, note, you can compare and contrast pretty easily and see the radical differences between these two. Now you have the idealized bodies. We're still going to have that, but look, here we have a theatrical, we have movement. This is basically re-re-Renaissance, re-re-classicism. And that's why we call it neoclassicism. Now, the theme from, if you don't have this written down somewhere from your book, this is the neoclassical art aesthetics. The themes are almost always gonna be nationalism and patriotism. They're going to focus on classicism. They're gonna have idealized bodies that are calm. Look how calm these individuals when they're about to go off the war. They are ready to fight. We're going to have Christian symbolism in the background. One, two, three, a triptych. One, two, three, grown women, triptych. Blue um, covered woman, the small male child, Jesus and Mary. Three, 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 Jesus is everywhere here. Divine light from outside. The patronage is largely going to be the government or the upper middle class. And they're going to promote Roman ideals and human rights. During this time period, I should mention we use Roman ideas because the neoclassical period did not know there was a difference between the Greeks and the Romans. To them, it was one great, huge, uber classical civilization that they just called Roman, their own cultural heritage rather than Greece. And so later on, we're going to learn that there's a difference. So this is one of the most famous artworks, what we call kind of one of the master artworks from this time period called Oath of the Heratai. It's from 1784. It's by Jacques-Louis de Fide one of the great masters of the neoclassical period, enlightenment period for the arts. And this is 1748 to 1825. That's his lifespan. So what do you think about this particular artwork? What's happening? All right, we have three sons or three men that are vowing authority to grab the three swords. And yes, they're about to go on fight. Why are the women over here sad? Okay, they're worried about the men. Even more so, the three men that these individuals are going to go fight are their husbands. So these three women are either going to lose their son or their, their brothers, or they're going to lose their husbands. Terrible, terrible choice. When these three brothers come back victorious, they are so upset that their sisters are crying that they execute their sisters. Why? Good nation state and nationalism patriotism comes before family bonds first we are americans then we are a family the nation state is more important than the family state and that's what's being promoted in this from a french perspective here's what david said and it's spelled david but he's french so it's pronounced david he says i want to work in a pure greek style i feel my eyes on antique statues I even have the intention of imitating some of them. The Greeks had no scruples about copying a composition, a gesture, a type that had already been accepted and used, spear bear used over and over. They put all their attention, all their art on perfecting an idea to give a body and a perfect form to one's thought. This and only this is to be an artist. Again, the idea from ancient Greek, remember we talked about from artistry one, perfection, to try to have everything perfect. And you can see it's clearly a ripoff of the Roman statue of the Augustus of Primavera to here in military garb, even wearing um, Roman toga dress. The master of this painting style that we're going to see over and over again is going to be Jean-Jacques David here, again, living from 1748 to 1825. You'll note his early portraiture, he lives during the Rococo at the very beginning. And so his early portraits actually have Rococo influences of wit and fancy. But he, like so many others, gets tired of this. You can see the more abstract, severe um, image from neoclassicism, where he's basically rejecting that final, that, that wit, that fancy, and that play for a more heroic subject. So he's going to come up with the Oath of Arata, as he is. And here, his father is killed in a duel, which is a quite common way of dying, actually, in the um, neoclassical period. If someone upsets you, you don't generally go to court. You go and you actually have a duel. 
He is a terrible student and he's got a facial tick that keeps making him, and he's so worried about being bullied that he often just skips going to school. He studied abroad in Italy and he is in charge of making the French Revolution history in real time. So he is the artist that's put at the front that basically is creating and writing the French history because this is before photography, right before photography and it happens. He is considered the dictator of the arts of the first French Republic. So he can kind of controls the artistic output, kind of the way the academy or the government controlled her. And he's the leader then of French academic salon painting. So if you want to have a painting show, you kind of have to do it according to the dictates and the styles that he wants. His images then largely deal either in Greek and Roman classical antiquity, or they specifically deal with setting up a new national standards. So here's the death of Socrates, really critiquing religious and political ideas from 1787. Socrates, if you don't know, was actually put to death because he was actually seen as leading people astray from the Greco-Roman world, rather than just what he was doing, teaching that you should question everything about you, and you should question your leaders. It's exactly what we want Americans to do, question your leaders. That's why we have a free and open press and a democracy, which supposedly and ancient Greece has. So Socrates was offered this poison to drink hemlock, and but he was also offered, if he would just recant, he would, he would not have to drink it and be able to live out his life. And he said he refuses to recant because he is right. He is actually preaching exactly what he should be. So he's actually teaching even during his execution. Credo, one of his students, offers to illegally free Socrates. Socrates says, no, I am not going against the state. I, he's willingly dying as a martyr to promote the ideals. We have one of his other students handing him the hemlock. We have Plato at the very end of the table, his teacher leaning down. Um, or actually, yep. Yeah. And then we have another um, individual over here, literally begging. And you can see here, this is Plato's Republic talking about the best governments actually lying at his feet, all created. And we have Socrates' wife then over here crying that Socrates is about to die. Now, when we are inventing things from history, we don't really know the true story. But when we're inventing things as we get closer and closer to the modern history, not from classical Greece and Rome, we generally have pretty good accounts. So here's an image of Napoleon crossing the Alps. And the Alps are actually at Napoleon at St. Bernard Pass, which is a place in the Alps from 1801. Excuse me. The theme here is nationalism, patriotism, classicism, idealized bodies, Christian symbolism. It's got all of those. And yet it's made up. This is making up Napoleon to be a completely amazing, awesome general. And maybe he was, but in this painting, it literally is made up within it. What is wrong with this? All right, no one rears back on the edge of a cliff. Napoleon didn't ride a white horse, makes it very easy to shoot that individual. As we can see in the next one, look at all these strange things that show up. Napoleon, basically rather than as Captain America, this is Napoleon as Captain America. It's creation of a cultural, of a French cultural hero. We're gonna have fourth wall breaks. He looks out at the viewer, he's looking at you. He does the orator's gesture like, I got this. He's larger than his horse. He was known as being a smaller man, but even with that said, he's larger than a horse. A white horse is a symbol of peace. He's battle ready military individual. The wind is blowing from multiple directions. If you look at the way the drapery, the way the, the tail and everything moves, Divine light coming from nowhere, bless him. The light actually comes from over here. It's where the sun is. A horse rears back on a ledge, not gonna happen. Image labeled for clarity down here. It's, I can't see, it, but it says Napoleon Bonaparte. Basically laboring, they are talking about the individuals who have crossed over this path as like Hannibal did from the ancient Greek and Roman civilizations. Bright orange color in wartime, just not worn. And he holds the horse incorrectly with one hand. It's just, it's made up. It's made you to think, this is my war hero. This is my Captain France. If he's out there protecting me, I am going to be safe for all eternity. Beethoven, and this is Beethoven's third symphony, I'll be playing a piece of from 1803. He originally dedicated this to Napoleon. Because Napoleon said he's going to come back and restore equality and rights for anyone. And then Napoleon declared himself as an emperor about five years later. Beethoven took out his score, and you can see right here, erased Napoleon's name 
from the third symphony so hard that we actually got rid and ruined part of his own score. So that's how offended he was. Beethoven was very much about the rights of individuals, about good, solid government. And when someone declared themselves a military dictator, declared themselves as emperor, he had a problem with it. So listen to how graceful and wonderful this. This is actually Beethoven's third symphony, originally dedicated to Napoleon, about Napoleon, about his exploits. It's called Eroica, or Heroic. How heroic was Napoleon as we continue on the scene for the Beethoven? This is another image before photography. Again, it's made up. This is Napoleon visiting the plague stricken at Jaffa by Antoine Jean Gros from 1804. Napoleon never visited Palestine, he never made it there. Napoleon never went near the plague. What, what military leader, what king would go near the plague? President um, Trump is not going to hospitals during coronavirus. Um, President Obama did not go to uh, a hospital that had Ebola. We just don't do that. There's a sense of, of protecting your leader for continuity of government that shows up. But note here, not only is he showing up here, but remember, without photography, no one know, he ordered these plague soldiers burned after they were shot in the head. And yet here, he goes and he touches them, basically trying to heal them the way Jesus would heal them in a miracle. And so this refers to J.C., Jesus Christ, and the idea of doubting Thomas, where he's actually curing. Note his other individuals that are with him, holding up these maps. Remember, bubonic plague from Artist 31, the death rate is about 91%, and you are contagious for three days. The best, most humane thing you can do to the people in your army is to actually kill them and burn the bodies, because only 9% of them even emerge out. And anyone who's taking care of them without modern kind of military and technical kind of medical gear is probably going to get it and die. That's what we're looking at here. And so this is heroic until we realize, oh my goodness, he's becoming an emperor as well. So these are the images you would make as propaganda to send out to your people when you're waging war and show what a wonderful, amazing general you are. And images like this that would have people flocking and want to fight for you. Because look what my military leader will do. He will go and even cure the sick that are dying of the most disastrous disease. Now, as I actually show you the next image, I don't want to have the heroic music on, as I'll talk about it in a moment. There. This is the death of Marat. As we start looking at this, also by Jean-Jacques David, don't worry about who Marat is right now. What we want to do is we want to concentrate on the image itself and how the image is depicted. Note, the neoclassical aesthetics are here right in the middle. Their nationalism, their patriotism, classicism, the beautiful idealized bodies, the beautiful Christian symbolism. As you can see, if you can't make it out, you probably have an idea who this is based upon. Humanism of the intellect, patronage about the government and the upper class, and Roman ideals and human rights are showing up. In case you don't know who it is or who the artist, it's even signed here with Murat by Jean de Louis David. The comparison, of course, is look at how close that is to the dying Jesus. So Murat here is being compared to Jesus, who died almost as a martyr for our sins. Here he is holding a letter, and he actually had a skin ailment that made him take fast um, each night to actually help him with that skin rash. And so you'll notice the blood here as he's bleeding out. Even in death, he's holding up that pen and that lovely letter because he was the person of letters and of the artistic canon that shows up. Now, the unfortunate part is that this is all great propaganda. This guy's a genocidal maniac. And so during the French Revolution, there is a time period called the Reign of Terror, where Robespierre, Marat, and Jacques-Louis David are basically in charge. Jacques-Louis David is involved in the art. Marat is involved with the kind of the, the military and what's going on in the prisons. Robespierre is in charge of the politics during the time period. If we actually look at Marat's real aspects, he is the leader that's in charge of the Jacobins. He's a radical pamphleteer, and he is responsible for signing the death notices then, still holding that pen, of 1,000 to 1,600 deaths in the 1792 riots. 
none of them actually had their day in court. None of them had a fair court trial at all. They basically, most of these people were executed because they were wealthy aristocracy. They might have been good people. They did not care. He was murdered in his bath then by Charlotte Corday, who's a sympathizer with the aristocracy. So she writes this lovely letter to try to get a gain and in installation, uh, get into he this private bath with this absolutely black background. So it's just him highlighted with this divine light coming down. She gains access, this beautiful woman, and when they're actually talking, takes out a knife and stabs him in the neck. And that ultimately is going to, going to kill him. And he was able to do this, or she was able to do this, because she knew that he suffered from a skill ailment. So they take these long baths at night. So it's the executioner. But note how beautiful this image is. If you do not know the story, this kind of looks like Jesus in a Christ-like boat. Look, none of the trappings of wealth. He literally is in the middle of a darkened space. And it's basically God's light that comes and highlight, highlights this basically serial killer. So propaganda is really good when used effectively, particularly before we have things such as um, uh, photography that we can use as fact checking. Later on, we're gonna have the coronation of Napoleon. You see coronation here. He's coronating actually right above um, his queen, Josephine. Josephine later will coronate him or there are contemporary accounts that he actually coronated himself in front of resplendent wealth. And you could note all the individuals that are here. We have Napoleon, his wife Josephine on her knees about to be crowned. We have Napoleon's mom, um, number four over here, Napoleon's son, the king of Naples. So you can actually, even the Pope was there. And so you can see a number of individuals. Not all these individuals were here. This is a made up fictitious way of actually creating him as this powerful, because even the Popes and the Egyptians and the Ottomans all over the world did they support Napoleon. Just wasn't the case. One of the more challenging figures we have from this time period is what are we going to do with Marie Antoinette? And we end up with some really interesting in, um, images from Marie Antoinette because she, man, her the people working against her were fantastically good with basically their Twitter feeds, with their modern day pamphlets. In truth, what you probably know about Marie Antoinette is absolutely false. Marie Antoinette is absolutely a loving mother. She is the individual, her marriage unifies two warring nations, France and the Austrian Habsburg Empire. Um, and so she is basically is that unifier. She does a lot of charity work for the poor. She gives up her money to balance the budget for France. She gives up her own personal expense account. The propaganda that got put up around her is for people who hated her. And they hated her because she wasn't French enough. She's German. She would never be French enough. And yet, if without her, you can't unify France and Austria. And so she's in a no-win copy. And we'll look at a couple of the images. First off, she's got a propaganda that she says, let them eat cake. Right here, the mean. We absolutely have that. That's correct. She has these notions out there that these people who hate her talk about her being a whore, a lesbian. She has incest with 10-year-old son. None of that is true. None of that is true. We have the idea that she's an Austrian sympathizer, that she supports with the Austrian over the French. Well, she is, so that might be partly true, but we don't have any historical evidence where that really took place. It was re reported that she received this diamond necklace for sexual favor she had from um, a man who was at court just not true, it is fictitious. And this whole idea that she shits on court culture because she has to move into Versailles, live by very close court culture, it's not case. You can actually, so this is not um, not untrue, but she doesn't, she just understand why things have to be so rigorous in terms of court culture, more than some of the refined, more relaxed postures that were in courts from everywhere else. Versailles had the biggest court culture that showed up. We even have these images of her rubbing Napoleon's penis to try to make it like she was in, in love with the, the phallus within the penis within the process. This is a propaganda image. It never happened. This is an actual propaganda image from the time of Marie Antoinette and, and her king. This is a real news story. Now, the one on the left, of course, we made up, so we highlighted it from the National Enquirer, but this is a real news story that was published and how do you counteract this if you were the queen? You can't really counteract this. So here's what happened. It says, with her right hand, the Princess de Laval, one of her friends, 
the Princess de Lamal foraged the queen's bush, talking about her private area, which was often dripping with sweet juices. The princess pulled a kind of dildo out of her pocket, which she then applied to that spot we take our joy in. It was attached with a wide ribbon which fitted over her hips most gracefully. And so there is this idea that King Louis, who had problems with an erection, was caused by a whore, and that whore being Marine Antoinette caught in a teen sex ring. These could not be further from the truth. It was all propaganda for people who aided Marie Antoinette. And so we ran into some major issues. But if you are a young individual, Marie Antoinette, a husband who has an erectile dysfunction, they used porn against her. And so these are all images of Marie Antoinette from her own time period about her and her sexual delights with different people that generally were not her husband. It's almost impossible because this is something that goes out to the poor. It goes out to the middle class. You generally don't see much of it. And yet people, how do you report back, hey, I saw this image of you. So this is the popular conception of Marie Antoinette in France. She had no right. She actually helped the poor. She should have been revered as a wonderful, wonderful queen. And yet, because she wasn't French enough. So how do you counteract that? Well, one thing, we're going to try to hide it. How are we going to hide it? We're going to hire a professional artist to help us. And so we're going to start showing, trying to show some motherly images of ourselves. So the artist we're going to hire is Elizabeth Louise Vigel Brun. She's an American. Her um, family, notice Le Brun, is part of the families that actually helped make the Vatican many years before. You'll note early on, particularly here's a self portrait of her. Here she's actually depicting herself as a Rococo. You note the difference between the styles of someone you know, dedicated to family and dedicated to the, the rights of values and much more pretty and beautiful and witty here versus any of the portraits we see over here. Her father was a portrait painter. It's why she was able to come with Vader. She actually is, becomes the official court painter of Marie Antoinette. And she's trying to soften Marie Antoinette's name and propaganda. She refused Academy membership because um, of what, the way they treated Marie Antoinette. Um, self-portrait smiling with an open mouth, first time we'd ever see that in art. And because of that, the self-portrait smiling open art, that robo -Go portrait, she had the thing labeled against her that she must be a narcissist, always like smile. Think about what they would do with people with Twitter and selfies today, like we talked about. And she was forced to flee France during the French Revolution for America or risk being beheaded, just as Marie Antoinette is going to be beheaded. So what's the message here? This is her, Marie Antoinette and her children. Note, during this time period, remember, most women, particularly wealthy women and queenly women, sent their children off to be wet nurse or breastfed by someone else in the lower class. Marie Antoinette does not do that. She has an active role in their life every day. She is seeing them. They love her. Note how they lean in. Yes, she's wearing upper class dress, but no, she's not dressed like a queen. She's dressed more like a wealthy woman here. And so, and the young boy over here, I can get control of my cursor. There we go. The young boy here points to an empty crib. That's because Marie Antoinette just lost her child. So a very young baby at about six months old. And so there is this crib that is left um, empty. So she feels the same pain as everyone else. That's what they were trying to sell. That really is more the image of Marie Antoinette. Even the idea of let them eat cake. Yes, she does say it, but it's not in the mean hearted way that we think. She convinced her husband, Louis, the king of France, because so many bakers were making poor level bread and only a little bit of it. So the poor would go and buy the poor level bread, but it would be out. So that's two francs. So the next level up, the more expensive bread was four francs. They'd only make a little bit of that. They'd make a lot of the cake, which is six francs, but tiny, like a cupcake. And so if you went in and you were there too late, you couldn't get, you'd have to use three days of, of, of salary for those two francs to buy that six franc piece of cake. And so Marie Antoinette basically talked her husband into passing the law that says if bakers were not making enough and someone showed up to buy the poor boulanger type bread for two francs and they didn't have it, they would have to give them the next level at four francs at the two franc price. And the six franc let them eat cake at the two franc price. So when they show up and they knock to Marie Antoinette and they say, the poor have nothing to eat. She legitimately said, let them eat cake because that was the bread then that what poor people would have been able to eat if they did not have it and would have still cost two francs. 
And so she was doing everything in her power to make it good. The propaganda machine behind her, though, was atrocious, particularly using these pornographic images. And later on, they are going to gu guillotine her. This leads us to Madame Tussaud, who lives from the Rococo into the Baroque period, but really seen as a Rococo celebrity. This is Marie Antoinette, that Madame Tussaud, the original Madame Tussaud, the actual Tussaud Wax Museum. Um, this is Robespierre, the leader of the, um, the kind of the, the Jacobin party during the Reign of Terror. And so this is his overmodeled skull from that after he was guillotined for being a menace to French society. Marie Antoinette, that is her actual head that is based upon the decapitated head then that was actually given to Madame Tussaud to make an exact copy for her wax museum. We see Lady Gaga, we see all sorts of celebrities. So this actually becomes a real tradition going back all the way to the French Revolution of making these wax skulls of the beheaded famous people that actually continues on, that actually form Madame Tussaud's wax museum. So she's kind of a celebrity back then. And here's how they're made. And I should say up here, in the upper right hand corner, is actually Madame Tussaud herself. That is her own self portrait. George Washington, we just saw. And Queen Elizabeth II. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So this was all started as a, a Rococo, and then it became part of the neoclassicism particularly during um, the French Revolution when they were beheading individuals and wanted to have models on pikes to show individuals. Now, we've looked at a lot of France and other places around the world. Let's not get confused. Here in the United States, we did the exact same thing. We are a neoclassical culture. So here is Washington crossing the Delaware from 1851. And if you really look at by a German um, American, Emmanuel Lutz, if you really look at it, it's kind of ridiculous. First off, the direction that we're headed, we're going the wrong way. The flag was not created yet. There's 13 peoples in a boat in that tiny little boat, which is remarkable because that represents the 13 colonies. Even more amazing, the 13 individuals all represent, if you look at their costumes, none of them are the same. They represent one person from each of the colonies. So this is complete BS. We also put a Native American in the back of the boat. We've got a woman potentially rowing a boat. That's just not happening for someone who is the leader of your army. Um, pre later, President Monroe is also in the boat at the same time. 
And so we have people from all over. The ice packs are too large. They're more like the Rhine River rather than they would be at the Delaware. We wouldn't go during the sun. And note the sun right here basically is lighting us up. So we're looking at almost everything is wrong in the possible that shows up here. We really looked at history. It'd be much more like this with the raft. It would be much more along those lines. That's what we'd be seeing. And of course, we have this in all sorts of videos today. So this is Walsing crossing the Delaware, but of course, across the road, causing a traffic jam. The first time we tried to make an image of George Washington was even a bigger unmitigated disaster, even though the other one we accept as world history, and that is this one. This is Horatio Greeno. And this is his wonderful depiction of Washington as a hero. But when this came out the first time, this was before, we said, this is not really our understanding of democracy or of a republic. Because of course, George Washington then here is being represented as, that's correct, the ancient Greek god um, Zeus. And Zeus at Olympia, uh, you might know from the Disney's Hercules movie. So we basically are predicting him bare chested. Still, we got the age category about right with the beard and the hair beard over here, the hair over here, but look at the ripped musculature. And we're just like, that's just not our conception. We're trying to get away from the kingling making. And this really makes George Washington look much more like a king than like a president. And we're going to see neoclassical architecture. Again, the recreation of the classical Corinthian um, columns that come out of ancient Greece, but are used in Rome, the Doric and Ionic. And whenever you see these, we are referencing back. So we're going to see this in our White House, very neoclassical our Supreme Court building, Thomas Jefferson's own designed home in Monticello, and of course, our Capitol building here. Today, we have individuals that are challenging this, and we always have to be wary with neoclassical artwork because neoclassical artwork still exists. There are still countries around the world that are developing their national heritages, and as they do, they need everyone to buy in with the message. They need a national pride and identity and you do that by creating heroic stories. So Hitler did it. Note, this is Hitler with a Jewish girl right before the atrocities began. Fidel Castro recently has done it with Nobel Peace Prize winner Nelson Mandela, celebrating the Russians and, and Lenin when they have the Russian Revolution. And note, they appear like a hero of the individuals before they really start to eradicate 25 million of the very poor in different aspects. And then we have George Washington being redone. Today, we have people challenging this neoclassical structure as well. So this is Faith Ringhole. And so she's challenging the idea of that, the idea of the patriotism and of the nationalism we have in the United States, because she puts three African-Americans, most notably up here, Frederick Douglass, for July 4th, who basically publishes an article that says, what to the slave is July 4th? Because it's not their Independence Day. They don't get their independence until the Emancipation Proclamation um, later on within the um, the Constitution. And so that's he's saying, why do Black people want to celebrate July 4, 1776? That is not their Independence Day. Here we also have two very other, Sir Jonah Truth, who fought for African-American female rights, and Harriet Tubman, who risked life many times to free more slaves than anyone else in the history of the Underground Railroad. So on some level, she's saying, our freedom comes later. It comes after the Civil War, and maybe even later than that, because we put people in prison after that indentured servitude for prison population. And so there's people challenging this. You know, here's the flag series with the flag bleeding. And if you really look closely at this, note, in the blue background with those stars says die. And over here, note the columns, the lines. If you really look at it, it says die, and then the N word. So the idea that America is not welcoming even today for people of African or African American descent. We have the same thing happening in the Native American community and community. This is John Quincy Smith, currently still alive, was born in 1940, and wants to challenge the idea of Native American culture and of Americans just using Native American culture. So here's states' names. So you'll note the vast majority of our states in the United States are actually named for Native American tribes or Native American words describing the land itself, whether that's going all the way back to Minnesota, to the Dakotas, to Montana, to Wyoming, to Colorado. Um, and the other image over here is left, trade gifts for trading land with white people. The whole notion is these are all African-American newspapers that are, and specifically all of them were done 
and all the images are on October 12, 1992. Now, any reason why you would use October 12, 1992? Any idea why October 12, 1992 within the Native American? What about October 12th? Let's get rid of 1992. All right, that's Columbus, Columbus Day in 1992, 1492. So that would be 500 years. So it's basically commemorating the 500 year massacre that Columbus started on the Native American population. The destruction of the population with the bloody color up here, but what remains, the pop culture kits that white people have basically incorporated and American culture has continued in and still using today. Now, we do have these individuals that are creating these wonderful images that show up. And one of the most famous of them is the tandem duo, Melamed and Komar. They are contemporary Russian immigrant artists that live here in the United States of America. And they actually are very famous for creating elephant art and selling his art, but also for actually asking people to sell them their souls and they'll give you a contract. You tell them how much you wanna sell your soul for, if it's within reason, Andy Warhol sold them his soul or this is Andy Warhol right here. He sold him his soul for zero dollars. And so here's what they want to do. They want to create a new neoclassical American artwork. So what they asked is they surveyed individuals around America with their favorite color, what their favorite scene was, what they would want to see in an American picture. And the picture before you is exactly that picture. Note, it's awful. Because when we take the best ideas that we have and combine them together, we really are doing what we practice and preach is the idea of democracy. So 44% of us wanted the color blue. There's blue. 49% wanted outdoor scenes with water, which is more than anyone else. 41% wanted large paintings with the size of a refrigerator. 56% wanted historical figures. So, and the most famous historical figure, George Washington. And so this is the America's most wanted when we combine what ideas we want to celebrate from America. Here are the different kind of variations, the shades that we voted on. And over on the right, America's least wanted painting. Those are the colors, the shapes, the ideas the, that we actually hate the most. I can live with that one. He does the same thing with Kenya. And note in Kenya and all over the world, they do. And note they'd say the same thing. Hopefully George Washington could be replaced with Jesus here. So we have Jesus, we have the mountain landscape, we have the blue, but we have that historical figure in the outdoor nature. In Italy, this is Italy's most wanted painting, which is radically different than ours in terms of the style and the realism. This is Italy's least wanted painting, which I think is hilarious. They said they did not want to see any more Elvis. So Elvis or Christian saints, this is Saint Sebastian that was killed by being shot arrows into his body numerous times. So they were tired of those two things. And this leads us finally then, as we look at nationalism to a different type of art career. This is called a political cartoonist. Political cartoonists make between $40,000 and then about $85,000 a year right now. The most famous political cartoonist of all time is Thomas Nast. You see his work over here. He is generally considered the father of the American cartoon. The Democratic donkey, he actually invented. And he basically, this is his invention of the modern day Santa Claus, that fat jovial guy that we kind of create. Up here, we have Lalo Alcaraz, who is the first Latino national syndicate. And his most famous cartoon, or one of his most famous, is Muerto Mouse. And he is an individual that, after creating this, Disney contacted with him and asked him about the problem, if he would want to be involved in a product. Um, so he was one of the cultural consultants, and I think animators as well, on um, Coco from Disney that came out. Because basically what Muerto Mouse is, is Death Mouse, or the idea that Disney was coming and trying to get trademark and copyright rights for Day of the Dead, a Mexican national holiday. And he said, that's ridiculous. We have Gary Larson. For those of you that know the far side, multiple books that he's actually published. This is my favorite with white anthropologists coming in, trying to talk to the natives. And the natives are like, oh my God, we got TV, we got VCR, we got electricity. We want to make the money and talk to them. We got to get rid of our modern day stuff and show them how we used to live. So it's anthropologists and they run to put everything in. Political cartooning then generally does not take that long, but you have to stay very up and it's for individuals. And so generally, you step one, you need an issue. Step two, you need a character. Step three, you need a satire or a joke that shows up. And we've actually had political cartooning, as we saw, going all the way back to the Marie Antoinette, that propaganda, that pornographic propaganda that shows up. And so here's a William Hogarth. 
this is Napoleon versus the king talk about small size of Napoleon, right? And what he wanted versus what the English king wanted in the size difference. Ben Franklin's original drawing kind of within the process of join or die for the 13 different states um, that, that are 13 different colonies to join together or fight against London um, in England and die. And so the question for us is that what are the impacts that neoclassical arts have on our world today? What's new and innovative that actually we would call this in many capacities, the birth of the modern world if we don't wanna believe that's the Renaissance. And that really is what we're looking at. And so a few things that show up. So we look at peace, justice, and strong institutions based upon a documented way of living for the last 250 years with our constitution. And now more than half of the world's nations have constitutions um, that are based upon ours. So we're gonna create nation states versus globalism, which we're increasingly moved at today. We're gonna to create national unity and pride. We're gonna promote democratic Republican values. Even conservative, remember, develops out of this as well. We're gonna put reason and emotion together and try to pull both, but reason is gonna dominate. And we are gonna promote the promotion of science and rationality over God. We have the separation of church and state for that. We want science and rationality over God, because otherwise whose God is it that we're going to worship in a multicultural democracy like the United States of America? And lastly, as we're getting closer and closer towards the midterm, let's run through some ideas. First off, please make sure you know the midterm and what the midterm entails. Remember, your midterm questions are all the middle column of your syllabus or your daily assignments which basically says essential questions and midterm questions, they are the same questions. The best way of doing this is go back and look at the information that you don't know all that well or that you've forgotten. Start covering that first. Almost all students make the mistake of saying, hey, I know this period really well, let me just touch up and then I'll move on. You're most active when you start studying um, at the very beginning. So you should start with the stuff that you really don't understand very well. And you should be able to make connections within the process. Why did this happen? Well, what's the next thing? Why did that happen? If you can make those links and ask yourself questions within the process, that's better. If you cram over a three-day period, over just a one-day period, it raises test scores by more than 25%. So the idea, because you learn in pieces. So remember, the human brain can only absorb so much information at any given time. And so in a one day cram, you are absolutely overwhelming the sufficient, the system. My highest recommendation is go back. We've been reviewing some of these questions over time. Go back and look at the two or three time periods that you understand the least about. Start with them. Take one, one week out and say, all right, I'm gonna spend and understand this culture tonight. The next night you understand another culture. The next night you understand another culture. And then maybe you start trying to figure out how do these things relate? How do we go from one time period to the next. You have all the questions and remember, know the format of the question. You will vote on whether you're gonna take the nationalized online exam, which is multiple choice, multiple answer, multiple select, or if you're gonna take the one where the nationalized um, exam in class, which is a bullet where you basically will have to come up to, for each question, which is more of an essay style, you'll have to come up with 12 to 13 supporting evidence points using artworks to support your argument. They both taste, test the exact same amount of information, it depends on the amount of um, extra credit um, that you actually want. The online version has less than the version in class. The one that's online, though, you'll have to know a fair amount more information because you have a lot less time to look anything up than for a question you might get a little confused on but have time to kind of correct your answers. So that's one of the things to consider. We'll be voting on that in class. So again, cram over a three-day period or longer and take breaks. Eat that good brain food. Take sufficient sleep. Sleep, ironically, is one of those things that's overlooked. And yet the more you sleep, the better your memory is of the stuff that you've studied. So if you can get a solid six to eight hours each night, at least six, but preferably eight. And if you think positively that you're going to do well, amazingly enough, that means you will do well if you actually can convince yourself. And that's what we're looking at. Have a great day. Bye.